plenty of them, uh, uh, something the size and power of the space shuttle at launch, carried out to mm, in a daunting engineering project. Uh, Absolutely. Does anybody know how much the space shuttle weighs? At launch, and then, good question. At launch? If we knew the numbers, we could go through the math. The answer is it would take a lot of space shuttles, and we could work out how many of you remember the mass of the space shuttles. Wouldn't it be more feasible to do a nuclear detonation in the area of the, of the thing so that the shockwave would push it away? You know, the point is there's a lot of people talking about a lot of things. I mean, maybe blow it to pieces. Another possibility is shine, shining a very bright laser on it. Mm -hmm. Vaporize one side of the asteroid, it, oh, right. the vapor would blast away, and by the rocket effect, push it this way, you, you turn the asteroid into a, its own rocket. There's a lot of possibilities that people talk about. Which is the best way to do it has not been worked out yet. All of them would be very expensive. And once again, all of them probably won't be necessary, but if they were, they'd be really necessary. <laughs> you know, I made, a I made a presentation to a geology class about this, and students said, maybe these are going to move the Earth. <laughs> or, you know, just change the rotation rate of the Earth so it lands in the ocean instead of land. <laughs> you know, if it's a fairly small object, then it just makes a big Flash. tsunami and wipes out every... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. In other words, how good is the science of knowing exactly where it's going to hit on the Earth? Because it would be very easy for it to a bunch of people to get out of the way, right? I mean, if you had a couple of years. Well, how hard was it to evacuate New Orleans? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay, okay, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> if we knew exactly where the asteroid was now, and exactly how fast it's going, we could predict to the inch where it would land. The problem is in knowing where it is now and how fast it's going now. That is something for the experts, for the people who track these orbits. The longer you observe an orbit, the more accurately you know the orbit. <coughs> if you see a, a stone just flying overhead, if you just take a single snapshot of it, you maybe know where it is, but you don't know how fast it's going. You take two snapshots, then you get some estimate for its trajectory. You have to observe it for a long time before you know its path to high accuracy. So. The answer is that it, it takes, you know, let's say many not weeks or something observation even to know that it's an Earth-crossing orbit. I'm willing to bet it takes months or many months to, tr to nail down the orbit to any degree of accuracy. Um, it's not that our instruments are so crude. It's that you just need to work to track the orbit over a long way before you know what the orbit is. Uh, I sure don't know the details of that, but it would take a long time before we knew exactly where it was going to get. And during that time, there'd be politicians. I mean, just imagine the uproar. You know, I mean, don't tell me that it's going to land in Kansas. <laughs> that kind of thing. And persuading everybody to get out of the way, where are you going to put them? New Orleans. I'm curious, is there any... Extension because all the most of these near Earth asteroid searches are probably terrestrial. Oh yeah. Any plans for setting up like little hundred million dollar robot craft to search? Um. My guess is it's much better to do it right here because. Uh, To take a telescope and put it in the asteroid belt, remember the asteroid belt looks like this. Let's look at a picture of that. Okay, here's this picture. So we're in the we're here, and we are from here looking at all these places in the asteroid belt. Now, if you took a spacecraft and put it 
here. This spacecraft is further from here than we are. Right? So taking, I mean, the spacecraft would be able to really survey this region of the asteroid belt well, but it'd be very, it'd be worse at surveying this region than we are. Furthermore, it costs a few hundred million dollars to build a really fabulous telescope here on the Earth. It would cost many billions of dollars to take a fabulous telescope and put it here. In the middle of a rock fight. <laughs> rock fight, yeah. So, uh, it's probably best to do it from right here. Yeah? Uh, the theoreticians have calculated uh, the size of the crater based on the size of the object. You've got a million metric tons of bombs there. Mm -hmm. Has anybody theorized when the um, when the Earth's mantle will will crack? Yes. You know, I mean, at yeah. what point does an object? How big does an object have to be to shatter the Earth's mantle? Yeah. You know, there's one of these. I don't know. There's one of these. No, no, no problem. Um, there's one of these asteroid that's been discovered in which sort of one half of it is a crater. You know, so there's something which is kind of like what you're talking about. Also, I have this vague memory that one of the theories of the formation of the Pacific Ocean is that it's the result of a really big impact during the formation of the Earth. Now, I don't know how big it was. But also, a theory of formation of the moon is that there was a collision with Mercury size. Okay. Near collision. <laughs> you know, all the craters on the moon and all the. One of the things the space program has taught us is that almost every body in the solar system is covered with craters. Uh, the moons of all the planets, as the Galileo spacecraft visited Jupiter, as Cassini is visiting Saturn, passing by its moons, those moons are covered with craters. The Earth is not covered with craters, but that is because we have erosion. Uh, same with Mars. Jupiter, Saturn, they're all gas planets, so they wouldn't show craters. Anything that could show a crater is covered, and that's because early in the history of the solar system, there were lots of these clusters. I mean, any of the craters we see on the moon would have been a you know serious catastrophe. You've been around if you've been around when it happened. So uh, all the craters on the moon, all the craters on the other moons, are evidence that in the distant past, during the formation of the planets, <coughs> these catastrophes were really common. If an asteroid hit the moon the size of the one that basically uh, made the dinosaurs. Would that knock the moon on the first orbit? No. No. Not big enough. Uh, it would alter its orbit. I don't think it would eject it from the orbit. It, it might make it a little bit more elliptical, something like that. But it would not knock it out of orbit. No. Because if one, of, if one that size hits roughly every hundred million years, mm -hmm. one would have thought that the moon would have been hit by some within its time frame as it's orbiting the Earth. Absolutely. Why is it still here? And that is the reason for my answer. The point is the moon is still here, therefore it doesn't. The point is that the moon is quite large compared to any of these things. So these things do not give a particularly large sideways blow to the planet. You know, they cause a lot of trouble to life on the planet, but they don't push the planet sideways. As a follow-up, are there any craters that we're aware of on the moon that were caused by something that size, basically, a 100 million year event? Oh, well, oh, yeah. the Chicxulub crater is something like 100 kilometers across. The crater on the moon would be, well, you expect it to be a little bit smaller because gravity from the Earth was pulling that thing towards us. Gravity from the moon is weaker, so the velocity would have been less. So it's somewhat smaller crater, but still, that's a pretty big. I mean, lots of the craters on the moon are that big. Lots of the craters on the moon are bigger than that. So, 